Hi. Uh, participation design agency, we do participation and experience design, and we do it all over the world. And we do everything from educational board games to conferences on experience design to LARPs um, and everything in between. Um, and this talk is called experience, how to design experiences and LARP. But what is experience design, you may ask. Uh, and for me, it's uh, two things. It's a way of thinking. You can apply experience design to anything and everything. And it's an applicable toolbox with different ways of handling anything from very like practical issues uh, in your experience or life to design methods on how to make sure people interact in specific ways and so on. Um, <clears throat> and it, it is literally everything that uh, you can look at. Because, of course, when we go through an experience, the normal definition of an experience is that it has some sort of start, and then there's a transformation that happens within the experience, and then there's some sort of end. And this is from... Uh, religion studies where you, for example, you go into a hut and then you're there for three days and then you come out as an adult at the other end. And this is sort of the, the framework that we look at this. So, And of course if you go to a lab there's also a start, there's some sort of transformation where you do the thing that you do and then there's an end where you reflect upon the thing that you have just gone through. Um, an experience exists in time. It is defined by a start and an end on a time scale. It could be like this talk, which is about 45 minutes. Um, but there's more to an experience than the exact time that it is running. I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, it, of course, also exists in space. It's very difficult to say that an experience exists in the universe. Uh, you need to make sure that people are together in a specific spot. Uh, and the size of that is up to you, of course. Uh, it varies widely. Um, an experience has a narrative structure because we move through time and space, and we do this all the time. We generate narrative structures in all experiences we have afterwards. We try to sort of make sense of the things that we experience, and then we create a narrative that fits into your world view or fits into the view of the participants when you talk together. For example, in a LARP, there's no main story, but sometime after the LARP, probably at the after party or the days after when people are communicating about it, the story of the LARP emerges. So you experience one thing and everybody else experienced their thing, but then we sort of talk it through and figure out what this thing was actually about. And of course, it was nothing about that, but that is sort of the when you add everything up, that's what it comes down to. And the louder you speak about your experience, the more that will color and influence the narrative structure of the love you just went through. An experience has a social dynamic. Um, every time we do things together, there's all sorts of dynamics between the people that are there that will affect how you experience the thing and what your narrative structure will be. It depends on how you are, if it's in a lab, for example, where are you located within the lab? Do you have a position where you can influence a lot of people or a few people, or you can have a bad day when you, or, or a bad week or a bad month, and then you step into the lab and that will, of course, color the thing and you will color people around it also. Um, this is a question I often ask lab designers or experienced designers in general, is that when does your experience start? So if you're a lab designer, when does your lab start? Or the experience of the lab? When I hear about it. When you hear about yeah. it, that's the, that's the answer, at least I say is correct. Um, this is when people's experience of the thing that they may or may not go to starts. So it's super important how you present it the first time, how much information do you give out, and so on and so forth. What is the direction of the information you give? What have you done before? Who are you? Who are the people who are excited about it? All this, you are not in control of it, not all of it, but you should at least be aware that you can maybe push it a little bit. Some of it you are in absolute control, for example, your website. How people are talking about it online, 
maybe not so much, but you can at least give them the correct information if they're wrong and so on. And this is when it ends. Mm -hmm. It never ends. People are still talking about games that are lives that happened 20 years ago. Uh, so, and it keeps it, the narrative uh, of the LARP or the experience will continue to evolve and you will have to deal with it no matter what. So LARPs that were done in the mid 90s that I went to, uh, when we talk about them today, it's like, how could you do such a thing? That was so fucking dangerous. And then you say it's a different time and so on all the usual uh, excuses or you didn't know any better. And we just have to recognize that we will continuously be in conversation with everything we've done previously. And we should uh, be aware that it's not criticism of the work, but of course the world evolves as well. So you need to be ready to have the discussions over and over and over again. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is a, a thing I say. I say we're, we're pretty great at making LARPs. And we are pretty shit at making experiences. Mm -hmm. I've been to many LARPs that were absolutely brilliant, that started three hours too late, or the food was cold, or you didn't get information on time, or you got it too early, and so on and so forth. So the LARP part, I think we're pretty good at, but everything around it sort of, I don't know, the the... The work of the lab itself sort of takes over at some point, and then you sort of forget of doing everything around the lab, which is also the experience. And uh, we need to be better at those parts, because only if we do those parts well will people be relaxed, they will feel safe, so they can go into the lab and be brave and do all the weird shit that we ask people to do <laughs> about. There's a lot of questions I ask when I do experiences, or go and analyze uh, experiences. Uh, for example, if we go to, say, a museum or a train station, uh, there's a lot of experience design questions you can ask to sort of activate that part of the brain that, that will make your experiences in other fields way better. Um, what happens the first five meters and the first 15 seconds you go into, let's say, a museum. Do you know where to go to go to the exhibitions? Do you, do you know if you can bring your bag or not? Do you need to pay or not? Do you feel welcome? Uh, I think in many museums I've been to, this is not very clear. Um, and number three, are your affordances clear? Affordances is a word that comes out of computer game uh, studies uh, which is about what are the possibilities of actions you can do in a specific situation or with a specific thing. So for example in a computer game you can walk up to a com computer game door and you go to it and then you try to see if you can open it or not. Most of the times doors in computer games don't open, it's only part of the scenery, it could be a wall. So that door does not have the affordances of a door in real life. Some of them you can open you can even lock some of them, you can break down some of them, and so on. And all those things you can do with the door is the affordances of that door. So when you walk into a train station and you say, okay, wh what are the possibilities I can do here? Is there a place I can buy food? Is there a place I can store my bags? Can I buy tickets? Where can I buy them? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, do you feel safe? Super important questions. If you don't feel safe, you will not be able to uh, have an overview of your affordances or anything else because you will be worrying about your safety. And it doesn't have to be like, am I being robbed? But simply, do you feel safe in the, in the situation? And of course, when you leave, did you get what you wanted? Um, and does that experience you just had had some emotional impact on you? And this is my my favorite example of the shittiest experience design I've met, I think. This is in Copenhagen, it's a water culture house. And you can go there to swim and get massages and go to different classes and so on. 
And when it opened some years ago, I went there, super excited. It's a beautiful building. It's going to be great. And then you walk into the locker room. And this is the locker room. And then you go in. And what you do, you take off your clothes. You put on your bathing trunks or you put a towel around it because you need to go shower. You go to the storage units. And then there's a weird display with no instructions. So you have your clothes here <laughs> and your towel. And you don't know how to lock your valuables in the closet. And then you realize after some time that the instructions for that little display is on the outside of the dressing room in the hallway where it's not socially acceptable to walk around in your towel. So you have to put your clothes on, go back out again, read the instruction, go back, take your clothes off, hope you remember the instructions, and then you can lock the thing. When you've done that, you walk into the next room over here and you need to take a shower and you want to put your towel on the wall, but there's no place to hang the towels because the architect didn't think it was pretty with those things on the wall. So you have to put it on the wet floor and then take a shower and then you have a wet towel. That's a beautiful way to start interacting with a building or a place, right? And this is shitty experience design. It's also shitty uh, architecture and all sorts of other stuff, but it is foremostly super shitty experience design. They have not thought about the journey through the building. They have not talked to people, or maybe they have, but they have asked all the wrong questions, right? So, design, as I said, is a powerful toolbox, and it shapes behaviors, opinions, groups, and societies. And this is, if you make people, if you change their behavior because of your experience, that will change people's opinions about stuff. I've experienced that many times in life. Uh, it will change the groups that you are in and hopefully over time or in time it can change societies as well. So it is a very powerful tool and it can do a lot of beautiful stuff. And ex in experience design we talk about designable surfaces. And that's, that's, it's not only like the floor and the ceiling and chairs and so on. It is everything, the way people interact with each other as well, is also a designable surface that you can make a decision on. And the big daunting, frightful revelation is of course that everything is a designable surface. Everything can be designed. You can make conscious decisions about every aspect of your experience. All the physical stuff, how you communicate with people, how they will interact with each other, so on and so forth. So it's both social and physical environments can be designed. A well-designed experience will cover as much as possible, but of course it's absolutely impossible to cover everything unless you have a shit ton of time and a shit ton of very experienced uh, designers. Uh, Disney World is one of those places. Um, we went there a couple of years ago and uh, one of the Imagineers, as they're called, the people who designed the parks, said, why do you think the garbage cans are the distance from each other that they are? I said, I, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's, um, I don't know. And, and then, then she said, we've measured the distance people are willing to carry a piece of thrash in their hand and when they don't want to carry that anymore, they'll throw it on the ground. That's where you put the garbage cans. And we don't want our crew to walk around in the park with garbage, because that doesn't look nice. So everything you see in, in Disney parks is not on the ground floor, but on the first floor, because below is the garbage pneumatic tubes that sucks the garbage out of the garbage cans and to the waste disposal. So they raised this massive place so you don't see people walk around with garbage. That is, that is pretty well designed, I think. Also extremely expensive, um, but they have the money. Disney have the money, of course. Um, this is something Johanna came up with, which is that the opposite of design is tradition. It's not absolutely true, but it's a good shorthand for if you do whatever your organization or the people that you've been designing with have done without thinking about it, you are not designing anything. You're just doing the thing that people have always been doing. 
maybe if you think about the design and the experience you want to give people, you will end up with the exact same thing you're doing now. Perfectly fine, then you're designing. But if you're just doing the way, but we have always, orcs always have had plus two to their hits. That's not design, that's just tradition. So it's a good idea to revisit whatever you're doing every couple of years if you're doing a campaign, for example. I started out doing Vampire LARPing back in the day. And we, I just did what the other designers have been doing. Um, and then at some point we sort of realized that, for example, if you have rules about bombs, then people will build bombs. And then they leave them in the Copenhagen metro. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not good. So a, a good design rule is that if you make rules about it, people will use it. Um, we figured out that out the hard way. Luckily, people who found the bomb was other participants who then brought the bomb in. It was not the police. Um, this is another good example. Is the questions I often ask when I do labs or experiences is, is that the thing that we're doing now is that uh, contributing to the interactions within the LARP or is it taking away from it? And firewood is a good example of that. If you place the wood that your participant needs to use for their fires to make dinner and so on, if that is placed, let's say, outside the playing area, in an off area, then the participants will walk to the firewood, they'll start collecting it, and talk off-game talk with, their, with people around them, and they will stay there longer. If you place the firewood inside the play area, inside the fiction, then they'll talk about in-game stuff inside the fiction, which is better for the lab because they're there to interact with each other inside the fiction. And this can this question you can ask about basically anything. Will this give anything to the lab or will it take away from it? And maybe you want it to be outside, but you better have a good reason why you placed it there. So um, experience design, another word for that is of course manipulation. It can be, of course, you can manipulate people to do all sorts of stuff that they don't realize that you have made them do. But there's so much in so many of the interactions we do day to day uh, is sort of on an, uh, I wouldn't say autopilot because it's not that, but we're walking through life and we're making decisions. I, I have sometimes realized that I was on my way to work on a Saturday. I went out the door to go to the groceries and I was just thinking about stuff and then I walk in another direction. Probably you have also tried something like that. Um, and those buttons you can push with all sorts of beautiful things. A good example is food. If you serve food on a plate that has a high contrast color to the food you're serving, people will eat 20% uh, less and feel the same amount of food. Uh, Another, uh, another one is that coffee tastes better in a white cup than in any other color cup, even though it's the same coffee. That's pretty weird, right? But science studies have, been, have gone through all this and, and it is, we're pretty easy to manipulate in, in this direction. A good example, I think, is from Las Vegas. In the early 90s, the Bellagio Hotel started putting scents in the air conditioning system at the casino uh, because they postulated that people would play more. They would gamble more and they would lose more, so they make more money. And this is true. Uh, extensive studies have been uh, done about this both in, uh, in Dubai and in Europe and in Vegas, of course. And um, on a Saturday when you're rested, you play more than you do on a weekday. And if you put the sense in the system, how much more do you think people will gamble on a Saturday? What scent was it? Uh, it's different. So in Europe, it's mahogany, uh, cedar woods. And in the States, uh, it's cinnamon uh, and some other, uh, I think some redwood uh, smell as well. I don't quite remember, uh, but the scents are different. Scent? Yeah, uh, the smell, so. No, a percent? Yeah, a like, percent. How much more do you think people? Yeah, one, one <laughs> maybe. One percent. Twenty. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's called the effects of ambient odors on slot machine usage in Las Vegas casino. It's a great. Uh, and this is this is on the day where they actually already played the most. Yes. So okay. there's a great incentive for the casinos to put stuff in the air. <laughs> And all of this can, of course, be used. There's a whole field called behavior, behavioral economics uh, that I thoroughly enjoy uh, because it gives you little insights in how to push people's buttons, you might say. And all of that can, of course, be applied in experiences and lives as well. Uh, another good example is that if you know your participants have to wait before the live starts, serve them something warm because people uh, will wait patiently up to twice the amount of time if you serve them something cold. That's very useful, of course. So if you know you're running late, bring out the coffee and tea. And this, of course, also reflects into lab design. I'll just go through some various uh, uh, things so we can sort of frame it a little bit better. Uh, in the earlier slide where, where an experience had like a, a start and then there's a transformation and then there's an end, uh, in lab theory we have been talking about a magic circle for quite some time. It comes from a book called Homo Ludens uh, from sociology, uh, which is that there are places in our societies where rules apply differently than normal. Uh, a good example is of course the boxing ring. Uh, if people, people inside the boxing ring are meant to hit each other as hard as they can in the face. It is expected of them. If they did the exact same thing in the parking lot, they would be arrested. So we have agreed as a society that inside the boxing ring, it is perfectly fine to beat the shit out of each other. Theater is of course another uh, forum. When the actors are on stage, we have decided that they are not actors. They are also actors, but they are also embodying a different character to they are performing to us that they will not recognize that we are in the room, at least in traditional theater, right? Um, wedding, this is of course an experience that exists in time and space. Um, you go into the church, if you have a, a Christian wedding, uh, you uh, say, I do to each other, and then you walk out, and this society have, your status in society have actively changed. If the same three people, the priest and the bride and groom, uh, sat in a bar the night before, did the exact same ritual, uh, it would not count. Because it was not in that specific magic circle that we have established. So what we are creating when we create labs is also, of course, magic circles, because it's very clear that there are different rules that applies inside that place. And you need to decide for that, and you need to decide for the transition into that thing and the tr transition out of that thing. Especially if it's very intense, then sort of the crossing the boundary in that space can be uh, quite uh, difficult or challenging. So if you as a designer or organizer of, of an experience, you need to help them step into that space. A place that I absolutely think is the worst with this is like a space we're in now, now cinemas. You go to a cinema, you're going to watch this movie you've been waiting for a long time to see. You have a beautiful emotional experience. You get up while the credits are rolling and then you're led into a cold back alleyway and you don't know where the restroom is or if you can get back in and so on and so forth. So you, you take all these people on an emotional journey and then you just throw them out into a back alleyway. I think there's, there could be a lot of business for cinemas if you were put into a place where you could actually sit down with your friends and talk about what you just experienced, maybe get a little bit to drink or a cup of coffee and so on. But there's sort of a tradition in cinema design that you're just thrown into alleyway because you need people into the cinema as fast as possible for the next movie. Um, I think it's very weird. When we design labs, we do a lot of stuff to make, give people agency to act inside that world. 
you have rules, you have mechanics, you have these affordances, you have an alibi, you have an understanding, and feeling safe. And I'll go through all of them. Uh, rules is, of course, rules is the rules that applies for the lab that has nothing to do with the the lab, the sort of in-game lab itself. It's like when do you need to be there? Are you allowed to hit each other in the face? Uh, can you bring alcohol? So on and so forth. So rules that applies to real world things. Then you have mechanics, which is often in this lab we don't use steel swords because that would kill each other. We use, and that's a rule, but we use buffer swords. And if you hit with this foam sword, it will count as a real sword. That's a mechanic. Does that make sense? Then we have these affordances. You need to be absolutely clear. What, what can you do inside this lot? What, what, what are your possibilities for action? Alibi, uh, I'll explain. Um, so, alibi is the thing you need to be able to do stuff that you feel is awkward or difficult that you have a hard time doing and so on. So you're out here in your comfort zone and you need to get over here where the magic happens. Alibi is bridging the gap between the two or moving you into the place so you feel that you have, you can actually do it. A good <coughs> and easy alibi is a mask or if you go to a dress up party, we've all been to a costume ball and you behave a little bit differently because now you're dressed as Princess Leia or Indiana Jones and then you you take a little bit of the things that defines that character and then you act it out yourself because you have the alibi to do so because you're dressed as that person. Um, I've done a lot of parties for companies and a thing that you want at parties is to pe for people to dance, also at your private one. Um, but you And you can put up all the physical aspects of that needs for people to dance, dance floor, music, maybe some lights, smoke machine, mirror ball, and so on, and then still nobody's dancing. Uh, so what I've done, both, both privately and, and uh, in business, is to have pe hire people or ask people to come to the party only to dance. You are the first on the dance floor. I will pay you money to be on the dance floor all night. But it's very important who you choose to be on the dance floor, because if you choose somebody like John Travolta, um, nobody will dance because you need to have a lot of alibi or a lot of guts to go out there and dance with this guy. Uh, you will hire this guy instead. Um, Sai has said uh, dress classy, dance cheesy. And you want somebody that dances like an aerobic instructor from the early 80s. Uh, then people will not feel threatened. They will feel they have alibi agency and the affordance to dance if you do it that way. Um, and all of this will together create agency. And agency is when you feel, uh, as the little formula, you feel safe that you can do stuff without being ridiculed. You understand what you can and can't do. You understand the mechanics of the game. You understand all the rules around it, what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And then you can step into the thing. And this counts for, uh, for LARP. Of course, in other experiences, you don't have these mechanics necessarily. You can't have them. Uh, and that will push you or help you or guide you or the participants to step into this magic circle and feel confident and laugh their asses off. And everybody will have a great experience. Or you hope they will. Because... You never know if people will have a great experience. You can have a lab where 99% of the players have the best time of their life, and then there's this person, for whatever reason, bad casting, or they're playing with somebody they don't like, or they have some issues from back home, or school is troubling them, they have a bad experience. And of course, you need to take responsibility, or at least support the person and, and recognize their situation and say, uh, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, is there anything we can do to make your experience better um, and help them as much as possible? Uh, often when we have done lab and we have an off game room, we have a person who is in the room to take care of this and do some damage control, or at least motivate or manage people um, and so on. 
And then there's the other 99% who have an amazing time. And there's a very important thing that we as designers of labs need to distinguish between, which is when can we take credit for people's experience? And this is a super hard question and it's very hard to answer because I've been to some of the shittiest labs in the world and I had the best time because you were with the right people and something magical happened for no reason whatsoever, absolutely random. Is that, the, is that something that the organizer can take credit for? I, I don't think so. Uh, so when you organize lives, you really have to be careful about saying we did an sh- amazing job, because maybe you did. You have to analyze and evaluate and talk to people uh, to see if you can find the things you could have done better, uh, what was really good, try it again. Also, a thing that happens a lot is that if you, after a lot, a lot of people start saying how great it was, you're not going to hear from the people who thought it was shit because they don't want to ruin the mood. And they're definitely not going to tell you. So, because you did all that hard work and they want to be your friend or whatnot. So that is super hard, that sort of the, that work you need to do afterwards. Um, yes, I think I went over this. Let's just skip it. And for those who were at Joanna's talk earlier, she said one of the most important questions you will ask, either as a participant or when you do your lobby, is what will you actually be doing? What will the participant actually be doing? We have this crazy world, it's going to be the most evil uh, vampire, whatever, whatever. Yeah, but what will you actually be doing? What are the verbs that the participants can do? And at a dance party, it should probably be dance, it should probably be drinking a little bit, but it should also be feeling safe and hanging out with your friends and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but when we talk about the verbs in LARP, I think often when you go to LARP websites, you have to decipher what it is the participant actually will be doing. It's going to be this crazy city and we're going to, we're going to hang out and so on. Yeah, but what are we going to do on day three? What are we going to do when we start the LARP? Will there be dancing? Will there be fighting? Will there be scheming? Will there be plotting? plotting? Will there be murdering? So on and so forth. So what are the verbs in your experience? Um, later this year, we're doing a LARP called Inside Hamlet. We did it last year and in 2015. Um, and uh, the LARP is divided into three different acts. Um, which sort of also defines what are the core verbs of each act. Um, Act one is decadence. You are at the decadent court of Claudius at Castle Elsinore uh, in Denmark. Act one is a decadent party in the bunkers below the castle. So decadent party uh, very fast will give you like there'll be dancing there'll probably be a uh, debauchery and kissing and scheming and being horrible and so on and so forth uh, then three months later in act two all of the people at the court are still at the castle they have not been home because it's uh, of course on the siege then it's deception and then you'll be trying to get out of the castle you'll be scheming and you will be murmuring and you'll be panicking uh, and so forth, uh, and the third act is death, so of course you'll be dying. It is Shakespeare, everybody dies, or most people die, right? So will you be doing, will you be killing, or will you be dying, or will you be doing both? So, uh, and this, uh, of course, needs to be explained more in detail, uh, but think about the verbs when you do stuff. What will you be doing at your LARP? or at least ask organizers when you go to a lab, I often ask, so what, what, what are the actions that I can perform during this thing? <clears throat> because if you don't design, people will. I think I have been to some labs where none of this was very clear, and then you just do what you always do with your friends. You will fall back on the tradition that you come from, and if you draw in participants from many different lab cultures, and you put them in a game without explaining what 
what they can do, then they will do whatever they do in their own lives. Um, and then you're no longer in control, and maybe you want that, but it has to be a conscious choice, and not just something that you do. Can I give an example? Sorry? Can I give an example? Yes. Solving the plot. In some LARP cultures, when you go to LARP, it's very important to solve the plot. Like the purpose of plot is to solve the mystery. In other LARPs that were not designed for that, if you solve the plot, you break the LARP, because then there is literally nothing to do. So this is in, for people who are in either tradition, it's obvious, but you literally have to become aware of it for yourself and communicate it to the player, and then you need to make the whatever verbs you want them to do, like solving or exploring or uh, um, marinating in the emotions or whatever the hell it is. You want to make that playable in the design based on the verbs that you, yeah. that you have. And it is super hard to spot when you're inside your own lab culture, because you're inside it and it's very difficult to do. In 2008, I was invited by an American artist to go and do a fantasy lab at a sculpture exhibition in the Netherlands. It was pretty weird, but also a pretty good game, or I thought it was. Because I designed it to my tradition, and then we came to the Dutch players. And in Dutch culture, there's a very, very strong, ingrained part, a big part of their culture. There's a specific Dutch word that I don't remember, but which is that you always compromise. No matter what, always compromise. This lab was built around conflicts that will never be resolved. <laughs> so the lab started, and uh, it's a two-day lab, and four hours into the thing, they have uh, compromised on everything, and there was nothing to do. And it completely failed, and they went home a day early, because it was absolute shit, of course. Uh, we realized this, which, of course, because I, I, they said all the same words that my lab culture uses, but they meant different things. And then we changed maybe 10% of the design, and then it worked suddenly. Because we removed that part of perpetual conflict and made it about something else where they had continuously to go to different gods, and that would create conflict between them. But then, then they could solve them, but then they'll go out again, and they'll do it and do it over and over again. So uh, look at your design. If there's problems, fix it. Uh, my ego took a big hit, and I think from then on I learned that lab design is absolutely about having no ego. About It's about the design. It's not about you. Uh, and that will make better labs always. So, less ego. This is a good model to when you do your design and you are figuring out what to do. Then there, there are sort of three modes that you can do your design in. Um, and often when you're early in the design phase, you talk a lot about how, how, how should we do it, or what should we do. We want the explosions, and we want uh, these uh, family structures, and so on, and they will be doing this, this, and this. And very rarely we go up into sort of the core thing, why, why are we doing this specific lab? Because there's so many good lab ideas, so many, but why are we doing this specific one? Why are we doing it? What are the purpose of the thing we're doing? And that should sort of seep down through all other decisions. If you do not have the why, then you should probably stop and sit down and talk about why this specific lab is not a different one. And when you figure out what that why is, then you go back again and look at all the cool what's going to happen or how we're going to do it and reiterate those so they fit the why, the reason why you're doing the thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, it is very hard to do, I think. I think often when I do this, and then we talk about the why, and then I always sort of fall down or go down one level, and then I talk about the what, because what is very easy to talk about, how is very difficult to talk about. So it's not easy to do, but it's a, it's a very good thing to, to uh, focus on. So... You had this one in the last presentation, or? Uh, not so much. No. Okay. Almost. So, you have your thing, the thing that you're doing. That is your thing. That's the lab before the lab starts. When the lab runs, then it's their experience, your participants' experience. And when that is over, then it turns into part of the subculture that, that we are in. 
and you need to sort of identify who are the persons in these circles, who are sort of making the thing, because it's not only the organizing group of the LARP, there's a lot of people who have input into the thing. You're taking stuff from previous LARPs or pre other designers and you need to recognize that and so, or so on. Who will take part of the experience and who are the people in the culture that this will also affect? I bet there's many LARPs, at least in my experience, there's many LARPs that I have never played that has affected my culture or me as well because they have been very profound, or they have invented new stuff and so on, and that will bleed into everybody's lives within the subculture. And that is sort of the scope of when we do love. It's not only the thing you're doing, you're also affecting everything else around you. And that's, it feels like a lot of responsibility, and it sort of is, but you need to focus on your thing and you need to make sure that it talks to your culture, because if you make a thing that's vastly outside your culture's reach, then there will be uh, animosity between the two, uh, so you need to understand uh, how it fits into your gaming culture. Um, and this is a timeline of how we experience experiences. Um, there's your lab in the middle. That's let's say it's from uh, it's from runtime until people leave your location. But before that, then there's the when people hear about the lab for the first time, it's out in it's part of the culture, and people are discussing this something they want to go to. Then they sort of decide, not, okay, we're gonna go, or we start engaging with it. Then you step into the next circle, and that is sort of the the experience that people are having with your thing. They read your website, they have the border, and then they're deciding, and they're moving in, and then they sign up, and then they they play the lab, and so on. And there's expectations all the way, and these expectations can be managed. Your website will make sure that, for example, I, you know, I have organizers that I know that next time they make a LARP, I will go because I really enjoy their work. So it's before the experience sort of starts. I know I will step into it. That can be managed as well. Then you are inside the sort of people are talking about it, they're engaging with you, they're deciding to sign up. They have the characters and they talk to all their friends and also going, all that needs to be managed as well. Because if the expect, if the height of the LARP is bigger than what it can deliver, people will be disappointed. So you need to manage people's expectations. You also need some hype to make sure you, you sell the tickets and people are motivated to do, do the extra effort to be part of the thing. But if the hype is out of control, then you will disappoint people when they arrive. Absolutely sure you will do that. So you need to manage that. And then the thing runs and it ends. And then there's this reflection phase where we figure out um, what was this about, as I talked about. Uh, and um, after a while, it seeps into the culture's memory. And this is the thing that if you did really well, then people will be expecting next time you do something, they will sign up because they liked your last thing. I have some questions that uh, I ask uh, when I do LARPs, um, and these are good questions to sort of get the grasp about the the why and the how, and uh, what reality are you creating, what are its limits and boundaries and so on, what kind of society, be it big or small, and that's the society of the lab itself, but it's also like family structures or friend structures or work structures within the thing. How are those set up? What are its rules? Um, what will you want them to take with them afterwards? What it is? What is it that you give them by participating in your thing? What are they taking away from it? What do you want them to tell their friends about your experience? Uh, and what do you want them to do? What kinds of roles will everyone in it play? And this is not characters, this is roles. What are the things that they can do within the thing? Uh, what are the activities? What are the verbs? Uh, how will you prepare them for the experience? And that's expectation management. There's not going to be any restrooms for four days. You'll have to take a dump in the woods. If you don't tell them beforehand, I know a lot of people will be disappointed. Um, 
and how are you guiding their expectations in this phase? Because if you just say hard no to a lot of stuff, then people, of course, also will be uh, more reluctant to sign up. So you need to sort of guide them through the thing. Who's invited? And who would you prefer to exclude? Do you want everybody to come? Is it okay if you have Nazis there, for example? So on. Um, who will be excluded for reasons beyond your control? At Inside Hamlet, unfortunately, we cannot have uh, people who have uh, trouble walking because it's a Renaissance castle and uh, there's no elevators, and there's no way around those winding old staircases from 1604. So unfortunately, there's, there's people who can't lock there. We're very sorry about that. We'd love to have them there. What would need to change for the excluded to be welcome? Is it something about them? Or is it something about the world or the place of the location? This is one of Joanna's uh, things that I've stolen. Designing experiences is designing behaviors. And designing behaviors is designing cultures. And designing cultures is designing what kinds of worlds we live in. And this is what we do when we design any experience. Even the smallest ones should have this as a goal, I think. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? Uh, your definition of experience is narrow because it's uh, you said that it has a place uh, a place in the world. Or what do you mean by, what do you call it, location? Or it has a time and a place. It has a place. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, referring to digital games, uh, would you say they have a place? They, I think they have a place. So, if you play World of Warcraft, the, the play, they're sort of a two-layered place. One is, of course, the, the world Astaroth, I think it's called. The world that you're playing in, that's the, phys the the digital space you can move in. But there's sort of also more abstract places. If you play with a guild, maybe you have a website or you have a chat that you're in and so on. That's also a place. So it's not a physical place? No, may, often in labs, mainly it is a physical place, but it can be um, it's a physical space. You have a physicality at your computer also. There's also a body. There's always bodies in a room somewhere. And that place is also you can design for. Yes. You just don't have to be in the same yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, is reading a book an experience by your definition? Yes, yes, I think it is, yeah. yeah. And you can design how you are experiencing the book. So, and, and that can better make the reading of the book change, of course. So, yeah. the place in that case would be what the, the visuals and feel of the book is? Yeah, and the chair and. I, are you having a feed of? Is it cold? I, do you have coffee? So on and so forth. That is also part of the experience of reading, which is the verb in that case, or experiencing the book's world. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, um, I was thinking about m most Nordic LARPs are one-offs, or maybe two or three runs yeah. in short uh, successive order. And the experience design gets really weird when because you're always working bleeding edge. Uh, yeah. You don't have funding when you when you when you put the LARP up there. Uh, but uh, what's your experience with uh, like multiple run LARPs like Legion or De La Vette or one of those LARPs that Legion has been run nineteen times now. Yeah. And uh, so they have all the design, they have they've done the analysis, they've done everything. Mm -hmm. They can just rerun it. Uh, yeah, what's yeah. your experience with the uh, like multiple one LARPs, are they better at experience design or? Um, I hope they are, because you have more data yeah. and you can adjust. Uh, so I hope people are, are iterating so the fourth run of Legion is not the same as the 19th one. I think, I hope they're vastly different. Uh, or they lock the design down by number nine and now they're running the best possible way that they want to run it. Um, Hamlet is better. Hamlet is way better after we run it uh, three, four times now. Way, way better. Um, and the data also suggests that. So. so you have to constantly be critical of your own design. And of course, you learn and you get gain experience. And then you hopefully can do more detailed and more refined design. And you can help your participants better uh, within the frame 
work you have and the money you have and so on. So uh, I hope they get better every time. I think we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you.